what is going on my galaxies i promise this is one you want to definitely take a listen to so put it on in the car put it on while you're cooking dinner take a listen to david bianchi from razor he drops leaks he drops teases he definitely is giving us a good vision of where gala film is going and fyi the genesis the razor nft that has earning capability that's the only one that's left there's about 1300 left and whether you buy anything or not if you click that link down below for the wookie gala film it means the world to me and really does so much for my channel. So like I said, whether you buy or not, please click below and let's jump into what he has to say. What is that, my Galaxians? It's Dr. Wookie. We are here with none other than David Bianchi, producer, writer, and actor. We're going to be talking about Gala Film, Web3, and of course, Razor, which we are all super stoked about. How are you doing, David? I'm great, man. How are you? Great. Happy to be here with you. I, I'm doing fabulous. I mean, I, I'm absolutely stoked that a man like yourself would uh, be so humble to come onto my humble little YouTube channel who just hit 3,000 subscribers. Granted, all I do is cover Gala pretty much because I don't have enough time to do anything else. But uh, you definitely uh, uh, make me feel very special coming on here. Oh no! Stop it, man. I'm I'm happy to do it, and that's one of the cool things about um you know Web three is that like it we really like even at a at a community level we're kind of decentralized. Like, with the idea is to really try to cut out the middlemen as much as possible, and um, and if it weren't for Gala, like none of us would be here ha even having this cool conversation. So anything that's going to be supporting Gala, I'm all for. Yeah, and of course you. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm super excited about the whole Web three aspect because. Yeah, I mean, I have no idea how to connect with, you know, pretty much anybody uh, in any other way. Um, what I did want to jump into is anybody can read like a Wikipedia page. Um, right now I'm on the IMDB page. People can see, you know, all, all you, the films, shows, episodes you've been in. Um, I do have to call out just real quick because there was one episode of Days of Our Lives on here. Okay. My mother watched that show just consistently when i was a kid um so i just got to shout out my mom of course who watches the channel that david bianchi was on your favorite soap opera for at least one episode <laughs> <laughs> to be honest i don't even remember um that was so long ago um, yeah. but back, yeah back in 2016 out, 2016 there you go there yeah you go. Shout episode. out to the shout out to the soap opera world so um, what do people what do you want people to know about you besides that imdb page um I, I I guess I'm an artist first, right? Um, I'm an actor, uh, writer, uh, film producer, and fine painter and poet and a lot of other things, not necessarily in that particular order. Um, but because I'm an artist first, um, that's how I experience the world and it's what I fight for. Um, and so I'm able to cover multiple disciplines, right? Obviously, you know, the things that I just listed. Um, but I got my theater degree, uh, you know, from Arizona State back in uh, 2004. So I'm classically trained. And I moved to L.A., you know, believing that Hollywood was waiting for me. And, uh, and boy, was I sorely mistaken. <laughs> I, um, you know, one of the things I think is important about my story is that there's no nepotism in it, right? I don't have anybody who works in the high levels of Hollywood. You know, um, everything that I'm doing today is a result of just, you know, incredible self-belief, hustle, and determination. You know, I, I say it often that, you know, I got my SAG card doing extra work. I did extra work for three and a half years. And, you know, I was a waiter and I was a bartender for 15 years. And, um, you know, it's just like, it takes what it takes and you get what you get when you get it. And, at no point did I ever come to LA believing that I wasn't going to be a leading man, that I ever come to LA believing that I wasn't going to win an Emmy, you know, that I wasn't going to be eligible to win an Academy Award. Like that was just always just part of my narrative. And, you know, what happened, whatever in the in-between was just part of the process. And I think that that's an important lesson for anybody who is um, a startup, an entrepreneur, an artist out there is that, um, the the destination that you believe is coming oftentimes could take a lot longer or could come sooner but you have to be willing to just accept the process and continue to work and to continue to believe in yourself and own who you believe that you are you know even with no tv credits i remember back in 2004 people would, in la people would say well well what do you do I, well i'm an actor oh so what have you done well i haven't done any tv but i'm an actor i have a degree in theater i'm an actor you can't take that away from me and so um 
I think that 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 sense of perseverance is one of the most important things that defines me. Nice. That's that's well said. I, I think uh at least my expectations for this channel were absolutely nothing when I first started this. <laughs> I had no expectations. Um really, I know people have heard this before, but I just I only started this channel just to help out some of the Gala film community, you know, installing nodes and some stuff and uh mm -hmm. And then I just kind of let it evolve. Um, and, and, and then here we are uh, talking to the David Bianchi. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I appreciate the title, man. For it, you know, I'm just a dude. I'm just a dude with a cool job. <laughs> <laughs> well, it seems like you're having fun. And, and I, uh, Gal Film has definitely let you uh, definitely uh, make something absolutely, you know, incredible. Um, you know, I, I'd say you're... I guess maybe not using the word well-established in Hollywood, but you know, you've been in Hollywood, you've done quite a few things. You've been in a lot of projects. Why web three and what are your kind of goals and visions? Um, you know, web three was kind of an accident. Um, I mean, I've been collecting Bitcoin since 2017 and, um, and then, you know, come the pandemic, just like so many other people, we were all looking in which direction, what was going to be, you know, what was going to be the next evolution of, of, how were we going to make it? Because we didn't know if the lights were going to stay out. We didn't know if the checks were going to keep coming. So I heard about this, uh, you know, I was following this guy called Beeple Crap on, uh, on my Instagram for quite a few years, even before the pandemic. So I was already aware of what he was doing. And then I heard in 2021 that one of his pieces sold at Christie's for $69 million. And I was like, oh, wow, that's, that's fucking interesting. And um, so then I started hearing about NFTs and I started discovering them. So this was in like clubhouse rooms before, you know, Twitter spaces and all that. And this is, this predates the, the Board Ape Yacht Club. And so when I heard about that, my level of sort of understanding NFTs was pretty simple. Like the transition to NFTs was very simple because I already, stood, I already understood blockchain. And I had a deep respect for blockchain technology because of my work in, in cryptocurrency. And so I was like, okay, cool. Let's see what this is all about. And I really was just mesmerized by the smart contract and what Vitalik had built and what the Ethereum uh, Foundation had created for the fine art space. And then I started discovering some of these OGs like Colby and Xcopy and all these, you know, uh, OG guys and some like even John Knopf, who was doing a lot of photography at the time. So, you know, understanding that for the first time in art history, blockchain and technology allowed for royalties and secondary sales percentages for artists in perpetuity that just blew my mind i was like a burnt matchstick and uh, and and i was just in these rooms hearing people so inspired about what this was doing and so i just investigated and investigated it and then i decided how i was going to be able to tap into this because being an artist i'm also interested in how was i going to be identified in the space I've done black and white stills, I've done fine art, but I was like, mm, but that's not really what my main lane is, which is filmmaking. And so I've been producing spoken word films for, at that point, probably about 16, 17 years. Um, experimental films told entirely in spoken word poetry that are socially conscious. And so I minted the first ever spoken word film as an NFT in March of 2021. There was a piece called I Can't Breathe um, that basically was my soliloquy to the murder of George Floyd um, in the summer of 2020 and so on. And so, you know, next thing I knew, I, I didn't really know how I was going to market it, but I minted a one of one and I was probably one of the first people to mint uh, a short form film as a one of one NFT. It ended up blowing up. Um, I was performing this thing in clubhouse rooms in front of, you know, 6,000 people. And um, it ended up being seen by, by the Floyd family. Um, it ended up auctioning successfully to the same gentleman that bought the $69 million Beeple. Oh, wow. uh, Forbes covered the story. And then from there, I was just in. Uh, once I realized the power of Web3 and blockchain tech as it relates to, you know, intellectual property, music, fine art, cinema, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. That led to tons of collections on Super Rare, on Maker's Place, and then I ended up uh, being curated at Art Basel, and some of the biggest collectors in the world ended up collecting my NFTs. And so that's how I ended up meeting uh, Vox. And uh, I uh, was speaking for Gary V um, at the first VCon, and I met Bucks at an after party. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is an important lesson, too, for anybody that's out there, that when you're out in these events and you're networking, just show a lot of teeth. Like, walk through a room and smile, you know. And we ended up having a conversation, and I didn't know who she was. And we just chopped it up about cinema and blockchain. And turns out they were embryonically developing a project where they were looking for filmmakers and film partners. And, you know, it was being in the right place at the right time, but it was also, you know, 18, 19 years of film producing that I had been 
you know, sharpening my knives and honing my skills as a filmmaker. But that led to a conversation with, um, with the team at Gala that ultimately led to us building a partnership and creating Razor. Yeah, no, uh, that's it's it's really incredible what blockchain is really kind of bringing us. And I think as we continue forward, I think the entire world, whether they want to or not, it, it's going to turn into Web three. Um, whether that's even real estate, you know, blockchain on real estate, you know, all the financial stuff on real estate. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely been uh, absolutely incredible to kind of see the, the evolution of, of web three essentially and, and just our blockchain technology. Um, yeah, I think anything related to information systems should have some sort of blockchain back of the house mechanism. Yeah. Um, you know, if we, we know that there was a day where people couldn't even fathom putting their credit card on the World Wide web. And now we can't function unless Google has a security <laughs> thread of our credit cards. Yeah. And so, you know, there was a day where a guy bought, you know, pizza with Bitcoin and now everybody's hodling, right? And so I think that you're right. In the next five to 10 years, I think every major information system is going to be somehow blocked back by some sort of immutable technology yeah. um, because we want open ledgers that automate information, that, that lock things into a mechanism so that we as human beings don't have to fuck it up. Yeah, yeah, no, I 100% agree. Um, so we know Razor is complete. Uh, uh, you guys are maybe doing some, some final touches yeah. and stuff. So, so how many episodes and how long ish is like each episode? Sure. Yeah. It's, it's a completed series. It's, it's eight episodes. Each episode is approximately 15 minutes. So it's a short form episodic. Um, you know, I designed it that way because, you know, I wanted to create something that would really appeal to, you know, the 18 to 35 year old demo. And that we like to watch stuff in, in snippets, you know, um, and I thought that'd be great because most of the stuff that we watch, we're watching on our mobile tech. Uh, and so with that being said, I think that Quibi, you know, so some of you may not may or may not remember Quibi, but it was a short form platform that was mobile only. And they did some interesting things. And, and I think that YouTube and TikTok have really established that. So eight episodes, 15 minutes total runtime. Um, we literally produced it and wrote the scripts and executed this in a blur at lightning speed, like unrelenting velocity and uh i think you guys are going to be really really excited so we have a release the teaser and i hope that you know we can cut to it ready teaser now video entry 432 time 0625 been up all night reworking the comms to sustain neural connectivity i can't afford another failed craniotomy my migraines are getting worse. If I fail again, the results could be dire. But what I've created is the next evolution of mankind. A colossal leap in brain-computer interfacing. It will reshape humanity. It will change. Everything. And if it kills me, maybe it was worth it. Uh, the teaser we dropped at Comic Con in San Diego in Hall H in front of 6,000 people, and it was just like a huge, like concert level sound and five jumbotrons. It was sick. And um, you guys are really gonna love what you see. Um, you know, because it's like Web3, when I was pitching this idea to Gala, I wanted to create a series that reminds me of the things that I love to watch. Black Mirror, Mr. Robot, Blade Runner, Children of Men. Like, those are four titles that all have deep influences in the world of Razor. And even from a, a narrative perspective, like it's the world that is like this alternative dystopian Los Angeles yeah. and cash is obsolete. Everything is everything is basically sold on chain. And, you know, it's you, you do it just by bumping your phones, you know. And so it's this dark sort of illicit world of cryptocurrency, neural implants, artificial intelligence, hacker culture and black market crime. Yeah. No, I, I, I love I've always loved like the dystopian kind of like movies, films, series and stuff um, like Hunger Games, uh, Maze Runner. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned Blade Runner, Waterworld. Even you remember Waterworld? <laughs> what an expensive! Uh, I think that was an expensive film. If I don't don't if I'm remembering it was, correctly, 
Yeah, it was one of the most expensive films to date, and the set sunk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah the set sunk. Yeah. That was a that was a huge, huge, huge debacle. But you know, it just goes to that's a great example of just showing you how hard filmmaking really, really is. Yeah. Like to do it at a high level, it's it's very, very hard. Have you guys decided how you're gonna uh, drop it when it does go live? Like, is it gonna be all eight episodes we can watch right away, or are we gonna drop like one a week? Or have we discussed that yet? Well, there's been some discussions back and forth. Um, I believe that we should do it one a week, um, but that is, you know, TBD because I think that there's something to be said about being that it's an inaugural project and we want to create conversation. We want to create dialogue. Yeah. Um, we want to create a little bit of FOMO. Yeah. So I'm thinking we might drop episodes one and two, and yeah. then maybe do three, four, five, and in consequential from there, and then sequential from there on out, because there's so much lore that has to be explored, and um, where you have this really incredible behind the scenes making of film that's going to be dropping leading up to the series, to give everybody a little bit of a cheat sheet, um, and uh, we also just got done. We're now finishing post production on uh, on some amazing extra immersive content uh, <laughs> that I think the audience is really really going to love. So and we're already sort of piecing together the franchise, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is really really exciting. No, I think it keeps you hungry too. You know, uh, you know, week to week. You know, uh, when things get dropped that way um versus just binging it all in one you know and just kind of seeing it as a blur so you're, you're talking about you know you film with some immersive content <clears throat> is there going to be maybe any kind of sneaky easter egg qr code kind of things in the series possibly or is that going to be just total not there, talk about <laughs> no there there are there are sneaky easter eggs in every episode nice. uh and you know you're gonna have to find them we're not going to call them out um, if you pick up on them, then, you know, you might have the opportunity to to jump into another little wormhole that will take you somewhere else. Um, I don't believe that this has ever really been done, like, at the wide streaming level. Right. Um, and, Q and QR codes is definitely a tool that we're using. It's a mechanism that we're using. Yeah. Um, and it's great because, you know, we, we, you can point those to, you know, any destination. And those destinations can change on, on, on a click of a mouse. So, um, yeah, we're definitely going to be doing some Easter egg stuff. And the immersive content that we've created is... You know, it's never been done before. Yeah, you know right. what we're doing, like what we're doing at Gala Film and and with Razor, and then this 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 bonus immersive content that we just shot. Like, we shot about thirty to forty five additional minutes wow. of immersive of immersive content of our actors in character, um, including uh, including uh, a, a graphic novel. That's uh, there's there's wow. all kinds of stuff happening. That's, that's, that's incredible. I don't, I don't want to like spoil it, but at the same time, so is it something that you almost, you know, if you find it, you go to it and it takes you to a place where you get to watch an extra segment with that actor, like a, almost story wise or lore wise? Well, exactly. So okay. um, like um, cool. imagine, that's super imagine cool. if we're, we're basically working to sort of gamify the viewing experience because okay. how do we take the viewing experience to another level? Like one thing that Amazon can do really well is they own IMDb. And so I can watch that and I can see the headshots of the cast players and I can click on that and then I can go straight to IMDb. You know, but that's sort of like informational. That takes right. me out of the show. So what if you were watching Razor and maybe, you know, you got, you know, you got a shard or you got a piece of content and then that piece of content can unlock another piece of immersive content where say you're watching a scene with two people, one person, let's just say, gets disappointed, right? And has to go off on their way. And then you can maybe click on something and then you can watch that character, that actor in character, having a mental breakdown over what you just experienced. Okay. That takes you deeper into the psyche of the character and deeper into the lore of the world, right. rather than just taking you to you know a profile of the actor, you're staying in the world of Razor and, you can, collect, and you can collect these things as you go along. That, that sounds absolutely amazing. I, I think that is just incredible idea, the, the immersive quality. I, I'm super excited about that. I had no idea you guys had, like, had that. So, man, I'm, I'm super stoked. That sounds so, so cool. Um, so with that said, do you have a favorite episode? I know that's going to be really hard. Ooh. Um, I, I think um, episode – I think episode seven is probably – is probably my favorite just because it's it's so it's so fucking ambitious and you know it, it kind of like really brings everything to a climactic place i think it's it's definitely something that the audience is going to be 
really really blown away by i mean we were able to really do some really really cool stuff and and every aspect of razor is is top-notch hollywood like there's yeah. not you know there's no independent filmmaker about it like you know this is pure studio level and and anyone who has seen the teaser knows that you know this is the kind of stuff that you would see on max that you would see on netflix that you would see on hulu you know our production value is right up there with the biggest of the biggest big boys right that's yeah that's awesome so how did you get Danny Trejo, Mina Suvari, and Emilio Rivera? <laughs> um, you know, it's a product of, uh, of just being around for so many years. You know, um, when I was writing the script, uh, the character of Felix, um, I already knew I was going to call Emilio. I've known Emilio for, me and Emilio, we shot a movie together called Philly Brown. That was about 14 years ago. It was a movie that made Gina Rodriguez a star. And so I also did some of the writing on that, met with the Sundance. And so me and Emilio met on that show. And he's remained, you know, a bit of a mentor to me over the years. And he's remained a homie. So when I was writing it, I was like, yo, this is Emilio. I was like, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do if he can't do it. You know, because it's not even about whether a man wants to do it. It's like, is he professionally available to do it? Like, because he was shooting Sons of Anarchy at the same time. So we actually had to reach out to Fox and we had to negotiate his schedule with Fox to be able to get him to come and shoot Razor. Um, but uh, so yeah, once once that happened, it, it was it was really it was really a blessing. And Danny, I had produced a couple of projects with Danny previously over the years, um, so I already had a relationship there. Um, and again, but that was also about his availability because he's a really yeah. busy guy. Um, Mina, uh, I had no relationship with um, our incredible casting director Claire Koontz, who's at CAA she had a lot of relationships and so we went really back and forth on who was going to be detective thompson and um you know mina her name crossed my desk and i was like is that possible like you know <laughs> i'm like can we do that and you know the most you know she basically said look let's let's submit the script to her and submit an offer and see what she comes back with and you know mina read the script and she was just like this is really really good yeah. and you know it really is a real testament that one, if it's not on the page, it's not on the stage. You have to be able to create a world that an actor wants to sink their teeth into. And then second to that, obviously the actor is gonna investigate who the team is. So when someone makes me an offer, I look at the script and then I say, okay, who's the director? Who's the cinematographer? Who are the producers? That's so important to me. Because if it's gonna be a smaller budget project, for example, and Razor is a smaller budget project by all things considered, I want to know that my likeness and that all the work I put forth is going to be nurtured and taken care of, that it's going to be well executed, that, that is most important to me. And then who else is in it? Like that to me is secondary to the directors, producers, and the cinematographers. So my body of work as a producer spoke for itself. So it was like, okay, wow, they really know what they're doing. They're talented. Okay, cool. And then she just fell in love with the script and, you know, and everything went from there. And she was just... She was just a gem to work with, just so succinct, so on point, so on time, um, just really, really generous. So I, I was following you on Twitter when you guys were doing the filming. You guys filmed in like two, three days, right? Like, like no, uh, it, it wasn't it that fast. I thought it, I <laughs> thought it, it was like that fast. No, it might have seemed that way, but we shot over the course of uh, seventeen days. Okay, um, which by Hollywood standards is lightning speed. Yeah, it's still fast. Um, so, to, so for anyone that doesn't understand that, so to give you some context, like, okay, so, so Wookie, what's your favorite show that you're watching right now? Um, oh man. Uh, top five, top I, five. I've watched Ahsoka lately. Um, okay. you, know, I, I, you know, I've watched all the Game of Thrones, of course. Okay, great. So let's talk Thrones. Lord of the Rings, Thrones. which took how many years? Yeah, so Lord right. of the Rings. So we, we could talk Thrones. You know, Thrones was, I know a little bit about Thrones. It's one of the, obviously one of the biggest shows that HBO has produced. So with all that being said, a, a show like Thrones is going to be shooting an average of about two to three pages a day max. Usually two because it's such an epic show. A lot of moving parts. They probably have an average crew size of about 200. So Razor had an average crew size of about 100 a day. And knowing that the studio system typically shoots two to three pages of content a day. Now one page equals approximately one minute of final runtime on screen. Okay. So a hundred pages will equal a hundred minutes. So we shot seven pages a day. So we shot basically two and a half times the volume that the studio system typically shoots in one day on a crew of a hundred. So the pace at which we shot this was really, really at the studio level is insurmountable. 
Um, and, you know, as a result of that, that means that as an actor, we only got like two or three takes. Like you, we didn't get what like, you know, some of the bigger players in Hollywood will get, which is five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 takes, you know, which is, it didn't have that luxury. So execution just was paramount. You just had to be ready and you had to deliver on that first and that second, that third take, or you just didn't get it. You know, so the pace at which we shot it was, uh, was pretty dizzying. So 17 days is, is a really aggressive schedule. Typically a show like this would get at least 35 to 45 days. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's crazy fast. Um, so with Gala film, we, we know they're doing, um, basically with the NFTs, they're going to be having like moments, you know, and you're able to combine these moments and like scenes, um, for like mm -hmm. collecting and earning. Um, do you, did you help choose the moments or, or are they still kind of in the process of that? I was just curious if you chose some of those moments and, and scenes. Sure. Um, no, I haven't necessarily gotten to that granular place with them yet. Uh, I know that uh, me and Hutch, we speak very, we speak regularly. And um, I think when we get to that point, maybe I might have a say in that. But I think that every frame of Razor, I'm proud of. Like there is not a single frame in these episodes that I think is, you know, worse than the next one. So um, you, they could take whatever moments that they like and I'm going to be super excited about it. Um, I, I can honestly say that Ray Razor is the most ambitious project that I've ever produced, um, but um, it's only the beginning. And, you know, one of the things I say often is that like you go into filmmaking or any major project, for example, you take your YouTube channel, for example, it's like you go into it believing what you want it to be, but it ends up becoming what it was supposed to be. You know, because the variables of the world sort of <laughs> add their two cents into the gumbo. Right. And, uh, and, and Razor, you know, not only did it become what it, it was supposed to be, it ended up exceeding my expectations. And um, so there's not a piece of it that I think that anybody's going to be disappointed in. That's cool. Um, so we know mystery boxes are coming. Yeah, they're coming. Razor mystery boxes. <laughs> so yeah. uh, my assumption is that there's some moments in these mystery boxes. I, I'm also wondering, are there some other things in there? Like maybe a chance to, you know, get a Razor hats or some merch or... Yeah. Or, um, or is that still kind of hush what's uh, in them um, yet? Yeah. I'm assuming that's well, coming pretty soon. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, I was like, look, we're going to be talking Razor. I got to wear the Razor merch. <laughs> um, yeah. I definitely want the community to have um, Razor hats and definitely Razor hoodies eventually. And that's why I just posted in the Discord not too long ago, just kind of like checking people's pulse, you know, see who really was bullish on the idea. So um, I would like to get some, some merch out to some people pretty soon. And I think that, yes, those opportunities should be made available. Um, you know, A24 has like a shop, you know, and I think that that's a model that we've been looking at. And, you know, um, the mystery boxes are definitely coming. There's going to be mystery boxes for every ad, for every title, I believe, that's going to be dropping on Gala Film. And, you know, the stuff that I just described, the immersive stuff that we shot, like that stuff is ultimately all designed for the mystery boxes. Right. So, you know, there's there's intercepted phone calls. There are a lot of first person vlogs of characters. Um, there is conceptual sketches and, and there's all kinds of unique stuff that I think only is going to be accessible, you know, if you're in the mystery box world right. and these, and these collectibles um, will allow you to access other collectibles. Right. So it'll be a tiered system. Now I'm not too sure how, um, how the engineering team is going to build that architecture, but um, that's the loose, that's the loose of it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'll have to talk to Hutch about how the the original NFTs too are are gonna play in. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if they're gonna be getting you know X amount of of moments dropped to them or whatnot. Which, um, I know the the top two tier ones have been burned long ago. There's still the yeah. the Genesis uh, Razor ones. Uh, there's thirteen hundred and twenty six of those. In case you were curious, how many are left out of the eighteen hundred and fifty? I think. So, you know, people still have, have a, a chance to try to at least snag those before they, you know, sell out once the hype gets yeah. going and, and the FOMO gets going. Well, that's the thing. I think that a lot of you, you just nailed it. Like, I think a lot of people are underestimating the value of those. Um, they really aren't realizing that, like, there's only going to be one Genesis poster for the, for the Razor series. There's only going to be one. There's never going to be another one. And you will have the chance to collect it or you won't. And I can guarantee you, I promise you that the posters that we've already built for Razor are nowhere near the Genesis poster. Like they are not identical. So, you know, we may end up minting those as well, or those may be airdropped, for example. So we'll see which way that the wind blows there. But, yeah. um, you know, we dropped that collection at the floor of the FTX news. 
right? So it was probably the most inopportune yeah. time to yeah. drop in an extra sure. collection. Sure, sure. But I, but we still ended up selling, you know, I think forty percent of the supply. Yeah. And whether you're getting them on secondary on Open Sea, um, you know, who knows? I mean, what are we going for right now on Open Sea? I guess that's a good question. Let me take uh, a look. Yeah, I'm not sure about Open Sea. Um, yeah, because I, I was looking at the store, and if anybody's yeah, you know they're... looking for this stuff, you know, those links are down below for the store. I'll put the Open Sea link. Actually, down below too. yeah, the people actually secondary is has smartened up because at one point secondary was below purchase price because now they're they're four they're 450 the on the gala page and currently in, in the store they're 450 but on open sea they're 469 oh wow you okay <laughs> yeah you can't get one for less than 0.21 e and then they quickly jump up to 0.45 so to a thousand and then 1500 yeah so the store's still better at the moment um, store is still better at the moment yeah yeah um, yeah and, and, look at the, uh, and it'll price blades. it'll price stay stay the best place to get them uh, until they're sold out is my huh. my guess my assumption yep and i'm looking at this i'm looking on open sea and there's n none of the blades are for sale they're all off market so the store is definitely the place to go and obviously you want to buy them on the store because then they're connected to the gala ecosystem and then if you yeah. want to merge them over to to layer one or then to, to mainnet then you can do that yeah um but like you said when the fomo starts stuff is going to go wildfire yeah everybody's going to run to the race and people are going to be like oh why didn't i buy them before it's just, yeah. you know it's it's just like <laughs> the, the crypto cycles like yeah, you yeah. Know, everybody wants to buy bitcoin now that's forty five thousand dollars. well yeah. wait a second it was like <laughs> yeah it's the crypto mentality it's the crypto mentality right it's always it's yeah. always saying oh, i should have i should have yeah, you know it's it like oh, yeah. it's, it, it, it's a follow the herd sort of mentality yeah yeah 100 yeah, percent. Yeah. um yeah. so season two has it already been greenlit? Um, well, I it, I it has not been greenlit yet, um, but um, we have already started building uh, the franchise out, and we have already started building uh, creative stitching into into season two. So I've already we've already written and completed the treatment for season two. Okay. So we know where the world is going to go. Um, we know what it's going to look like, um, and we know um how ambitious it's gonna be like it's gonna you know because you can't make a season two unless you're really leveling up and um so we're all aware that that's definitely something that we do want to do yeah yeah so and I, I know i know that gala is completely bullish on the idea like you know look in a perfect world um we would like to see razor go to five seasons six seasons seven seasons you know and i think that sky is the limit and as long as we all do our jobs and we you know really create something compelling and exciting. I don't see how we couldn't have that potential. It, so how much have you at least uh, kind of envisioned with Razor? Like, have you envisioned like a very long, uh, like storyline, like of where you're kind of wanting it to, you know, go? 100%, 100%. Um, you know, Razor is, um, it's, it's a global show, right? It starts out in the grid zone of Los Angeles, but because the internet you know, sort of creates, you know, this small sort of globalization, you know, Grimm invariably in season one ends up affecting different corners of the world, you know, even in some ways unbeknownst to him. And so international factions end up <laughs> basically swooping down on him. And so as a result of that, he gets pulled to all these different places. And, uh, you know, because people, people in Sri Lanka affect Los Angeles and people in Thailand affect London and you know, and so because of that, it's it's a big series. Yeah. How has how has been working with Gal Film? Have they allowed you that artistic creativity? Have you been felt very empowered like during it? I say this all the time that I have never had a better working relationship with a creative team than I have with Gala. Um, Hutch and Jono and 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 Bucks, even though she's no longer with us. Um, you know, and uh, the creative team and Eric and Jason and just everyone, they have kept every single promise that they've made to me. And they've really allowed me to be the artist that I know that I can be. And they've allowed me to do that without oversight, which is unheard of, you know, because typically in the Hollywood system, you know, you've got the financier and then, you know, they tell you to go off and make it, but they're very big brother. Like they literally live on your shoulder every step of the way. So if you have to do a rewrite, you've got to take that up to the top. Mm -hmm. If you've got to make a big, an actor decision, or if you've got to make a, a big location change, or you've got to make a budget change, you've got to go up to the top. And so the reason we were able to execute Razor the way that we did was because 
we didn't have to constantly ask Big Brother for permission to make creative decisions. So we were able to move like a cigarette boat instead of like, you know, the Titanic, the way that the Hollywood system moves because there's so many layers of decision making just to make one granular choice. And as a result of that, um, it really empowered me as an artist and empowered my team because we were able to be the best of our of the best of our creative selves because we didn't have to constantly stop to see if it was okay to make a choice. Yeah. Um, and you know, it, in in the same way, it also put a lot of pressure on me too, right? Yeah. Because I, I was under an incredible amount of pressure to not fail, you know. Because in some ways, this was basically my 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 proving ground. It's like, okay, David, you know, you, you told the big leagues you could step up to the plate and hit a home run. Okay, so now hit a 96-mile-per-hour fastball over yeah. and over and over again. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and, and don't fuck it up. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, and, and produce this thing and, and, and be the creative engine behind this. Oh, and also play the lead and don't fuck it up. You know? yeah. <laughs> and so um, the, the pressure that I was under was tremendous. But, I, again, I just can't thank Gala enough for – believing in artists and giving us the opportunity to create these worlds. Um, and I think that we have a really, really long legacy with this franchise because that's what it is. It's a franchise project yeah. and it was always designed to be that. Yeah. Have some, some excellent IP. Have you, have you looked at other parts of the Gala ecosystem? Like one thing that I think about a lot is, is the rep, you know, that social media thing they're trying to kind of work mm -hmm. with. The, the big part of that is the whole treasure hunting right? Mm -hmm. um, the geolocation kind of treasure hunting, uh, you know, mixed in with the NFT. I mean, I was super excited for once they get that roll in. Obviously, I don't think it's going to be ready, you know, for initial seasons of Razor, but um, I was just curious if you've kind of explored some of the other ecosystems, even Gala Music. Mm -hmm. the, I, people are going to be like, oh my gosh, Dr. Wookie, all he does is shill for this band. But City of Sound has some incredible, like, music songs that are very cinematic, um, and mm -hmm. that's why I bring them up so often is just because some of that music is so cinematic and I see, I just, I'm like, man, they could really make some cool, you know, music, uh, for some of these like Razor episodes or, or even intros. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I mean, I'm, I'm super bullish on everything that Gala is doing. Um, I've, I've touched a little bit in the gaming ecosystem. So I, I at least, you know, understand some of the games that are coming out. Um, obviously the Poker Go is a recent one, um, Spider Tanks and, um, you know, so, and I'm, and obviously the box versus well. Um, so I've, I've looked into all those things and I definitely see Razor having a game potential. Yeah, um, yeah. Having it maybe being a single player, like RPG style game, for sure. Um, as far as music is concerned, I actually going into post-production was super, super aggressive on the notion of getting Gollum music artists in the yeah. soundtrack of Razor. To me, it was like a perfect marriage and it made perfect sense. Yeah. Um, but because we're moving at such a pace to yeah, deliver it, because yeah. initially we were having conversations about launching this in October, 2023. Right, right, <laughs> and right. so, you know, we were like a rubber band constantly snapping. And, and because I think we worked at the pace that we did, you know, from a legal perspective, there just wasn't enough time to yeah. pivot, to get the artists in place. But I think that for season two, knock on wood, um, it's a guarantee. I think it's a must need. It's a, it has to happen. Like we have to figure out how do we cross pollinate the, the gala ecosystems into one package because film is, you know, obviously it's light picture and sound. Right. And so having music involved in that, I think is to me is, I think is a must have. And there are so many incredible musicians in the gala music ecosystem. And uh, I'm excited to, to see that eventually happen for yeah. sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm excited to see kind of that, and, that cohesion. Yeah, and the social aspect that you mentioned too. I mean, when I think when that when that platform is up and ready and rolling, we should be doing everything in our power to to figure out how do we interplay Razor into those like geo positioning games and and uh, and helping in and, and helping build that out as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fun question before I ask you a real serious question. Uh, <laughs> this might be a long list too, but I was just curious who who have you met that's quote unquote the most famous person that you think that you've met. Oh, uh, wow. And you um, probably have met a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I've had the pleasure to work with, um, you know, Sir Anthony Hopkins uh, on a show called Westworld. Uh, that was a really, that was a defining moment in my career as an actor. Um, and also Jeffrey Wright. Um, that was all a very, very defining moment in my career. Um, another defining moment um, was meeting Sidney Poitier. Um, most uh, most mainstream folks may not know who who Sidney Poitier 
was, but uh, it was a defining moment. I had the opportunity to, to shake George Lucas's hand. Um, you know, also very, very much a defining moment. Um, you know, it's these things sort of happen when you know you sort of walk the canals of Hollywood and you keep showing up and you do great work. You end up meeting great people that are doing great things, and um, I, I think it's it's little moments like that that oftentimes are enough rocket fuel to get you through the hump because any artist is going to have that hump that writer's block that creative block or that that imposter syndrome or i feel like i'm not good enough or i'm not smart enough i won't make it and you know somewhere along the way you meet somebody really interesting that has inspired you and it's that moment is enough to say okay i'm in the right place even if it is just a handshake yeah yeah the the imposter syndrome that's that's something that's uh hard to get over initially you, you know coming in new to something um mm -hmm. a ton of medical students feel that as soon as they get to med school you know you have this imposter syndrome i know i did i got to med school and i was like man i really don't think i belong here i'm not smart enough and then uh then i started talking to people and then i was like man i'm, I'm smarter than half these people i belong here <laughs> <laughs> what did you study uh, I ended up doing a uh, pediatrics is what I went into because that's where the happiest doctors go, of course. Mm. Um, and then right now I do uh, adolescent medicine specialty. So I do like college health kind of stuff. Um, you know, a lot of like, you know, broken teenager kind of stuff. Um, Got you know, it. teens with, with, you know, just issues, you know, dealing with a lot of stuff, which can be, you know, family related, all kinds of things, which kind of rolls into our serious question here. Um, if you are so willing, um, I know you've, you've talked about before kind of like drugs and alcohol in the past and like at least mm -hmm. like how that's kind of affected your life and everything. And yeah. so my, my question is, is if you're willing to talk about that and or kind of give encouragement to anybody struggling with those sort of things. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's <laughs> it's ironic. I, I, uh, I think right now um, I'm on like hour 44 of a food fast, just water. And um, <laughs> I woke up a little weak this morning. I'm like, oh, I'm like, you know, you know, but hour 44. And, and like the irony of that is that, you know, look, I, first off, let me just say I'm, I'm over six, almost seven. I'm going on seven years sober. I'm just over six and a half years sober uh, of, of free of alcohol and drugs. And, um, you know, when I used to do tons of coke, like, <laughs> you know, a, a being awake for 70 hours, 48 hours was like a common run. And I would commonly go 50, 60, 70 hours and not eat any food, just, you know, blow an alcohol and blah, 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 blah. And I'm sitting here now in sobriety saying, man, this is really tough. How the hell did I do this once a week? You know, because <laughs> you don't you don't realize how much you're punishing your body. Yeah. And you don't realize the destruction that you're reaping on yourself when you're living in that addictive lifestyle. And, um, and I, I speak very freely about it. Um, I don't speak at the level of press, radio and films on how I did it, but I can say that, you know, through the work that I do through my spiritual process, you know, I've been able to achieve greatness in my life and continue to achieve greatness in my life. And I'm living a life that I never believed that I wanted. Uh, there was never a time when I was, you know, drinking and partying that I ever thought that I could live in this world without alcohol and drugs. Like it was just so intrinsically tapped into and tied into everything that I did socially, intimately, uh, professionally, culturally, like everything had a drink and then eventually a drug somehow involved in it. Um, but eventually, if you're anything like me, you get to a point where it beats you into such a state of submission that you come to terms with the fact that if you don't make a change, you're going to, you're going to die. And you're either going to die a really, really long, slow death, um, or, you know, God forbid, you know, an overdose. I mean, especially with fentanyl laced and, you know, so much cocaine nowadays, you never know what you're ingesting. Um, and people, we lose people every day because of this disease. Yeah. And so my, if there's anything I can offer to anyone is that like, it is possible and people do change and you can live an incredible life if there's something like drugs and alcohol that are getting in your way and razor uh is a great example of that even this conversation is really a gift of of my sobriety because there's no way that i could have executed and delivered razor in the way that i did if i were drinking it just it's just, it's just not possible yeah. the way that i drink because i'm an addict like <laughs> the way i get down like i'm not normal you know and so for the people out there that are 
you know, addicts. Um, I hope that this message lands on you because, you know, you can find a better way of life and you can achieve your dreams if you're willing to change that one thing. And it's hard because that one thing means you have to change everything. You know, it's people, places, and things, and all the, you know, the, the, the other common slogans of it all. But, um, you know, I always put it out there that if anybody's struggling, shoot me a DM. I'm happy to talk to anybody who wants to make a change in their life. And I'm happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation and let them know how I did it um, because that's my primary purpose now. Um, I say it often that I stay sober for a living and I make money as a hobby. You know, I make, I stay sober for a living. I make TV shows and movies as a hobby because without my living, I'm not eligible for that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it is absolutely the foundation of everything that I do. Yeah. Well, I, I really appreciate you sharing that, um, you know, with everybody. Cause yeah, you know, there's, there's always, there's always somebody out there, you know, and for sure, mm -hmm. you know, somebody who's listening who, yeah, hopefully that kind of hits home that, you know, it's, 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 you can leave, you can change it's it's not easily gonna it's not gonna just be easy you know but sometimes yeah. you gotta make those life choices and decisions too of of not you know uh going with those friends to that certain place where you know you know what you're gonna do you know and it's, it's really tough so yeah i mean pain is the cornerstone of growth yeah. and you know especially in the web3 space like I've been, you know, you, I've been to blockchain and Web3 parties and they hit different. <laughs> you know, Web3 parties are pretty bananas. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of addicts in the Web3 space, um, you know, and, and it, 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 it could be a, a mentally unsafe place. And one of the things that I know I used to do, and I'm sure every addict out there does, is that, you know, you might be a really, really intense drinker or a really intense user, but you'll always hang out with someone who's slightly worse than you. So that you can always say, well, I'm bad, but I'm not as bad as Tommy, or I'm not as bad as Jimmy, or I'm not as bad as Sheila, or whatever that is, because yeah. you need you need people around you to co-sign your behavior. And so um, we we always are interested in making sure that we're like, you know, the lesser of all evils amongst our team, per se. Yeah. And we see that a lot in Web3. And so I, again, yeah, I hope this message lands on someone that yeah. that if there's uh if you feel if you feel that you need to stop. You could do it. You could do it as long as you're done digging. You know yeah. what they say. You say you hit your rock bottom when you're done digging. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I really appreciate that. Uh, definitely appreciate you coming on the channel, uh, just sharing everything with us. I feel like you gave us so much information. Um, hopefully, hopefully Hutch says it's all fine, and I can leave it all in. Don't have to cut anything out, but we'll see. We'll see. Um, and uh, yeah, I just want to, you know, heartfelt thank you again, David, for for coming on, talking about this. I'm super excited to see where everything goes with gal film with razor um really hoping we do get to see it just continue and build into like an amazing franchise and uh i'm really excited too to see how they kind of do an all access store with gal film and kind of what the what the offers are going to be you know with, with the film token and everything uh you know to, to get involved and to see some of those behind the scenes things and you know maybe even have a, a short cameo or something something fun so yeah, really cool. I, 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 we want to. I want to build all those things, and and going into season two, you know, when we have, you know, we'll have a larger budget and we'll have more time. Then what that does is it allows for more prep. So remember, in season one, I did the casting call on Twitter, right? You right. know, which you which you were a part of, and I loved it. Yeah. Um, I want to be able to have more opportunities to decentralize the casting process to make this amazing show accessible to actors anywhere in America that don't have agents or managers that just want to throw their, their hat in the, in the ring. And, and I want to take more time to develop ways that we can immerse the community and decentralize the, the, and break the walls down between producer and, you know, average person, because that's what we want to do. We want to put our arms around the community and, and hopefully, and, and nurture the community to the best of our ability. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, that's superb. I, I can't wait to just see how this all evolves. I, I think I think Gal Film is going to definitely change the industry, and people are going to take notice for sure. Yeah, and and I'm a node holder. Like I have two, I have two film nodes, and you know I'm in the Discord, so I'm I'm super bullish on the tech. I'm I'm really proud of what is being built, and and uh, I'm excited to watch the journey as well. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> hey, thanks again, uh, Wookies. Stay warm. <laughs>